Oh, my friends, I have ruined my life by following Jesus. Welcome back to the Faith of the Fathers podcast. I'm your host, Carl Gessler, here to reignite the faith of the fathers on this journey following Jesus, learning to cast out demons, which has ruined my life in several ways. Um, Not really, because I I knew this was coming, and quite frankly, quite honestly, I don't mind controversy. So, yes, that was clickbait. You're welcome. Anyway, I have been on this journey about of deliverance ministry, and I, I, I always want to point out why this is important, because people who are uncomfortable with this topic, and honestly, I'm just going to be straight up here, I would have been just, I, I have been uncomfortable with these kinds of conversations in the past for various reasons. Some, one reason was probably because I needed the ministry of deliverance, so I had demons in my life, too, that were uncomfortable um, and, and that's kind of a weird thing to say. This whole this whole journey into recognizing, reckoning uh, with the reality of demons being present um, in my life is a new thing, um, and that's that's difficult. And I'm discovering in my kids now. I, I'm seeing struggles that that are coming up with fear and anxiety, particularly that is so familiar to me. And the Lord's given me victory over it uh, through many different ways in a process, and God has used that process, and I know that we all have to have our battles, so my kids will have their battles too, but I still recognize it now, and, and, and I see a spirit, of, a spirit of fear, a spirit of, a spirit of anxiety at work, and I want to equip my kids how to fight that more effectively and sooner than I did. Um, but just like reckoning with the reality that my kids uh, may have demons in them, um, uh, and they certainly wrestle with demons. Uh, you know, many many of the people that are objecting to this, uh, my public um, proclamation of this ministry, um, also they don't like the idea that they can have demons. I get it. I don't like it either. But it's a reality, and I think one of the things that tests in us is do we really believe in God's love, that God's love is big enough? I've heard some people explain, too, that, you know, how can a Christian be saved and still have a demon? And one of the, one of the answers I've heard people say is that demons don't, live, don't reside in your spirit. Your spirit is saved. It's with Jesus. You've been united to G- with Jesus in spirit. But your soul uh, can contain demons. Demons uh, enter the realm of the soul. Um, that, that does make sense to me. Um, in some ways, I'm not sure if it does, <laughs> because, uh, you know, Paul says that the, um, he gave up a certain member of the church, member of the church, to, uh, to Satan so that his flesh might be destroyed in order that his soul might be saved on the day of Christ Jesus. So, I'm not sure, uh, and I haven't looked into that verse, um, as far as like, you know, is soul the best translation there or not. I don't know. My point is, I don't understand how it works. I just know that Christians do have demons. Um, And uh, we're going to look at a story here in the Bible today where Christians let Satan enter them. And these are born-again, spirit-filled, New Testament Christians. And it's in the Bible. So we're going to take a look at that. But I just wanted to say, like, this this is one of the reasons it's important. And I always want to point out why this ministry is important, um, because that way we don't retreat from it. You know, so many people are, are saying to me, oh, do, you don't want to get obsessed with that. Look, if you haven't cast out a demon, you're not obsessed with it. You haven't even come close. You haven't come, you haven't obeyed what Jesus said when he sent out his disciples to cast out demons. If you're his disciple, it's part of your calling. And until you actually cast out a demon— then you can't say that you're obsessed with it. I, I would say that the, the error falls on the side of you haven't done it yet. You know, um, that doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It just means it's an area you need to attend to. Um, so uh, why, why is this important? Well, today I was just in a restaurant. Um, it was a wa- the Waffle House, actually. Uh, I took out my 
um, eight-year-old daughter for her birthday, and she wanted a waffle. So, of course, you go to the Waffle House. When I was young, I spent a lot of time at the Waffle House because my dad, he said he had a restaurant ministry, which was not uh, it was kind of a joke, but it was actually real. My dad loved people, and he loved to eat out. He loved food, but I think he loved people more. He just liked to be out and about with people. And we would go to the Waffle House many times, and he would just talk to the waitresses and the waiters and the customers and um, really had a, a very impactful ministry doing that. Um, he had 12 kids, so he'd say, to people, um, hey, I have 12 kids, and I have a liberated wife. I give her all the kids she wants, and I let her stay at home. And he, he'd just say kind of provocative things like that and get conversation started. He always did it at the Waffle House. So I had good memories there. We go to the Waffle House, and I was just reminded of why I like the Waffle House, and that's because it's full of real people uh, who do talk to you. I just made conversation. Uh, th- there were three waitresses and a cook there and uh, the cook was the only one. I mean, he had his back to me, uh, working over the stove, so it made sense. But I'm I learned the stories of all three of the waitresses there who happily and readily talked to me very honestly. As a matter of fact, I invited them to come to our uh, church, and uh, there was interest there. But w- this here's the thing about deliverance ministry. I mentioned deliverance ministry and I explained what it was. Are you dealing with nightmares? depression, uh, suicidal thoughts. Um, and the, the one waitress was just like, that's, I need that. And I, you know, we talked about, actually this conversation got started too, because someone, uh, was one of the waitresses was bragging about her grandbabies that she loved her grandbabies and she couldn't get enough of her grandbabies. And I said, that's great that you have that, uh, mothering heart. And uh, I said, not all grandmothers have that. And she said, it's true. And not all mothers have that. And I said, that's true, and it's, you know, that's because of past hurts. Um, And this other waitress said, yes, amen. Like, she recognized that right away. And um, so, why do we do deliverance ministry? Because it helps preach the gospel. That's what Jesus did. That's why, you know, when he preached the gospel, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul said that the gospel is not in words, but in power. And Jesus didn't come preaching the gospel in words. He came only. He came preaching it in power. He was healing the sick. He was casting out demons, and he was proclaiming that the kingdom of God is here. And he was saying, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So it was the casting out of demons that uh, was the sign that the gospel was here, that that, that Jesus, uh, that God is becoming king in and through Jesus, that God is king in and through Jesus. That's the gospel, and it is made known through the power of casting out demons and healing the sick. And it's, it is, uh, you know, it's hard to get a lot of people in America to be interested in Jesus on a um, intellectual level. Hey, let's talk about Jesus and, you know, uh, your soul and sin. Not many people actually want to talk about that. Probably more than I think. I am. I am learning to step out more, be bolder. Just continue to, uh, you know, not assume. Uh, you know, dealing with spirit, a spirit of rejection in me. I need, uh, and I'm working through getting past uh, the fear of man and just being bold in sharing the gospel uh, more so. And. Uh, you know, but it's still hard to, uh, so, so I think, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm saying all that to say that I think people are more receptive than I give them credit. But still, generally speaking, it's been my experience that if you are just going to talk on a theoretical level about religion, about belief systems, you know, about atonement theory, most people are not going to be in, interested in that. And many people who are interested in it are interested in it for the wrong reason. They want to have some kind of intellectual argument with you, which is incredibly draining and boring, honestly. I I have uh, had intellectual debates with people that was fun. It was fun at at some level at first, but once you realize that this person doesn't want to know the truth, they only want to have an argument, it's as boring as hell. I don't want to be a part of that because that is just a waste of time. And I say it's as boring as hell because it's from hell. It is wasting time. We don't need to be having intellectual debates for the sake of intellectual debates. The point of a debate is to get to the truth. And if someone doesn't want to know the truth, I don't want my time wasted. So we can, uh, you know, I don't think there's a great interest in people talking about theory. 
religious theory, atonement theory. They want to know what has power, what can change my life. When you start talking about do you want to be free of addiction? Do you want to be free of nightmares? Do you want to be free of life-inhibiting uh, problems? Now there's interest. And, you know, I, I shared about deliverance ministry with uh, these waitresses there, and um, I hope and pray that they will come. They definitely showed interest. Um, and my point is that they were interested in that because they said, oh, that is a need I have. And if that can be met, I am interested in that. That is what the gospel is supposed to be. It's good news, you know. Like if you're going through problem, if you're going through a problem, and someone says, "I have a solution," that is good news. That's what makes it gospel. Uh, and just as an aside, uh, the one woman was a, uh, was a uh, African American woman, and we had great conversation. She, out of the three, was the only one that mentioned church and in raising her kids. And when this other lady showed interest in coming to our fellowship, she asked me what denomination we were, and uh, this uh, African-American lady just cut in and said, "Uh, you know, probably evangelical, like the ones that vote for Trump. And she said, did you vote for Trump? And she had this worried look on her face. And, you know, I can't tell a lie, and I'm not ashamed of it. I wish we had more time for, like, a a deeper discussion on why. Uh, I said, yes, I did, and she immediately looked down. Uh, was kind of ashamed, I think, and um, didn't want to show also her disapproval. Uh, so she just kind of busied herself all, all already. And, you know, that's just a grievous thing. There's there's um, so much there. And I said, you know, that doesn't that's not what defines me as a Christian that I voted for Trump. I don't think Trump is a Christian anyway. Um, you know, I have my reasons for voting for him and I would, uh, and I plan on voting for him again, if my vote means anything. And, uh, you know, that's a, um, you know, that, that's a whole other ball of wax, but it just, I just thought it was funny that, uh, and sad, funny in a very kind of sad way that that was, um, there was a, a parting of the water, a parting of the ways there that, uh, all of a sudden we were having this conversation and over, over the issue of Trump, uh, went another direction, which shows how often we find our identity in things that aren't Christ. Um, you know, uh, there are people in uh, left Christian religious circles, and there are people on right Christian religious circles that don't know Jesus. And uh, we want to cut through that fat, uh, through that garbage, and just get to Jesus. So one of the things that, you know, I'm not going to deal with this forever, but since I'm new to publicly talking about deliverance ministry, I guess I have to pay my dues and deal with the question of can Christians have a demon? And one of the um, one of the examples of this, where the Bible testifies to Christians having a demon, is in the story of Ananias and Sapphira. It's a troubling story, and I'm just going to start with by reading reading the story. I'm going to begin in Acts chapter four. And we're going to go into a few verses into um, chapter 5. And uh, I'm reading from N.T. Wright's translation. It's a contemporary translation. It's not a paraphrase. It's a translation. Um, N.T. Wright is a New Testament historian and scholar who I I respect greatly. Um, Especially, you know, in my... I went through my own deconstruction and reconstruction, which I have not... I don't have a problem with deconstruction. I have a problem with holding on to resentment towards God. I never renounced my faith. I never denied Jesus. I never even doubted Jesus. I believed, always believed Jesus was the way, but there was a time in my life where I just took the things I believed, especially growing up in a kind of soft, charismatic atmosphere and just analyzing, am I just, when I lead worship, am I engaging in just like an emotionalism behavior? You know, just taking things apart and seeing how does this work? Uh, and then putting it back together. N.T. Wright was instrumental in that process of just helping me kind of pull apart the scriptures, examine each part um, for uh, independently to appreciate what it is on its own, and then putting it back together in a very coherent way. And I think that N.T. Wright is incredibly rich, um, has so much to offer. He was actually on this podcast several years back when I called it the Gospel for Planet Earth. He was the reason I called it the Gospel for Planet Earth because of kind of the things that I learned through him, that the Gospel is for this life. It's for planet Earth. It's for right here, right now. Not It's not about getting your ticket punched for heaven, but that's an aside. 
Anyway, I find his translation very illuminating and helpful and challenging because of uh, some things that sound maybe a little bit different than the New American Standard Bible, which is the one I grew up reading and I use also for memorization. It's the New American Standard uh, Bible. Um, one one thing with N.T. Wright that I just, you know, he is a scholar, um, and this is not really necessarily relevant to today's podcast, so just since I'm talking about him and his translation, I just thought I'd add uh, N.T. Wright is um, brilliant, excellent at what he does. I think, though, um, where I've kind of just, not that I've broken away from him, but moved t- more towards the Isaiah Saldivars and the Vlad Savchuks and the Greg Locks is in t- 2020 and all that's gone down in our country in the recent years, I needed to move more away from kind of the armchair theology of um, of an intellectual world kind of sitting above the world and observing it and move into the hand-to-hand combat stuff where I'm like, okay, let's apply, let's apply this stuff we know. And there it gets a lot more dicey. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's fun to do theology with a cup of coffee, a pen or an iPad, write your thoughts, challenge beliefs and all that stuff. But uh, that's not what changes the world. So what changes the world is getting into the battle, hand-to-hand combat, doing spiritual warfare, and that gets a lot messier. And many times the intellectual um, the intellectual pride becomes an obstacle to overcome as we're trying to do ministry because in the, uh, in the world of scholarship, we want to look, be looked at with dignity and respect and being rational and reasonable and all that kind of stuff. When you get into spiritual warfare, you just come in contact with things that really um, challenge the way you view the world, but they also challenge the way other people view you. Whereas before they thought you were a very smart a biblical scholar, uh, very well-rounded and very thought out and uh, very balanced, and now all of a sudden they think you're a kook because you're doing the things that Jesus did, and it's stirring up things that are deeper than intellectual. It's touching on heart matters. Uh, and that's where people get feisty. That's where knives get drawn. And uh, that's where I am right now. It's it's very exciting, actually. Uh, and I find the intellectual stuff that I learned from N.T. N- Wright, the kind of the, the skeleton structure of the Bible that I learned through him to be very helpful. It's like a guardrail. It's like a handrail in this uh, in this more tumultuous time of ministry. So that being said, anyway, I, I hope you enjoyed that little side rant. But uh, we're going to go with Acts 4. Um, and, uh, let's see, we're going to start in verse 32 of Acts chapter four. It says, the company of those who believed those new Christians had one heart and soul. Nobody said that they owned their own property. Instead, they had everything in common. The apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord with great power and great grace was upon them all. For there was no needy person among them, since any who possessed lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sale, and placed it at the feet of the apostles, who then gave to each according to their need. Joseph, a Levite of Cyprus, to whom the apostles gave the surname Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold some land which belonged to him, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Actually, sorry, I should have started in verse 31, where it says, when they prayed, talking about the same group of people, when they prayed, the place where they were gathered was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they boldly spoke the word of God. So I've started here in ver- in chapter four as we leading leading up to the story of Ananias and Sapphira because the this group of people that is selling their land and their belongings and bringing it and laying it at the, uh, bringing the money and laying it at the apostles' feet for the distribution uh, to the needs of the church are uh, this is the group Ananias and Sapphira come from. And they are the people who were all gathered in one place, and they were all, the scriptures say, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke boldly the word of God. So the story that we're about to read about Ananias and Sapphira has to do with Christians who experienced the power of the Holy Spirit and were filled with the Holy Spirit. There was, however, chapter 5 begins, a man named Ananias married to a woman called Sapphira. He sold some property and and with his wife's knowledge, kept back part of the price. He brought the rest and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, said Peter, why did Satan fill your heart to, 
to make you tell a lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land. While it was yours, it belonged to you, didn't it? And when you sold it, it was still in your power. Why did you get such an idea in your heart? It isn't humans you've lied to, it's God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. Everyone who heard about it was scared out of their wits. The young men got up, took him away, wrapped up his body, and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter spoke to her. Tell me, he said, did you sell the land for this much? Yes, she replied, that was the price. So why, Peter answered, did you agree together to put the Holy Spirit to the test? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out too. This is a very um, sad and disturbing Story. It's also an awe-inspiring story, which I think was the point of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe Ananias and Sapphira committed a sin greater than um, many other sins. We all, you know, there. Are, I don't know how you can rate sins. I do think that there are some that are worse than others. I think, uh, you know, actually murdering someone is different. Um, you know, Jesus said, if you hate someone in your heart, you have murder in your heart for them, and and that is true. Uh, but there is some, you know, I, whatever. I think there are there are um, grades. I do think there are grades to sin. But in God's eyes, you know, one undealt with sin is the same as another. Un, every unrepentant sin is is equal because it all ends up in hell. Everything that every sin that we hold on to and continue to worship instead of surrendering it to God is hellish and will end to the, in the same way. So. Ananias and Sapphira, you know, there are, there are many people who have been, many Christians who have been dishonest. They've been dishonest about their tithing. They've been dishonest. Maybe they uh, stole money. They worked for a church and they stole money. Maybe they're a pastor and they were being dishonest with money. That stuff happens all the time. And people don't drop down, drop dead. Uh, I believe that this was a time where the presence of God was so profound, as it said in Acts 4, that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with power boldly about the Word of God, or spoke the Word of God with power, that God was just establishing His holiness, saying, you know, I'm not going to tolerate this kind of deception in the center, in the middle of my holiness. Um, I don't believe that Ananias and Sapphira, uh, I I don't assume that they're in hell. (laughs) I don't, uh, they might be, I don't know, you know, God is is a judge, Uh, but I don't think so. You know, um, I believe that they made a mistake. They got caught, and um, well, they didn't repent. O- only God knows. It's not really for me to decide. I think what they did was um, sad, and the whole church regretted it. Uh, they had to, you know, with the death there. But the point is that these were Christians, spirit-filled, and Peter says that Satan filled their heart. So is it possible for Satan to fill your heart? or a part of your heart, a place in your heart. Well, there are only two possibilities with Ananias and Sapphira. Some people might say, in in an attempt to defend the idea that Christians can't have demons, that Ananias and Sapphira were not true Christians. But before we rush to say that, we have to consider how many Christians, how many hundreds of thousands of Christians could fall into the same camp. Every Christian still battles the flesh, Are we prepared to say that Christians who struggle with sin are not real Christians? How many Christians lie? How many Christians, I mean, uh, sneaking to watch pornography is a lie. Uh, You know, it's a lie about who you are. It's a lie to your wife. It's a lie to your vows. Uh, You know, how many Christians are um, worshiping the God of money? You know, we we put money, making money before seeking God. That's an idol. You know, that's betrayal. That's the same thing Judas did. Uh, Are we prepared to say that Christians who struggle with sin are not real Christians? I'm not prepared to say that. Ananias and Sapphira were Christians who had opened, the other option is that Ananias and Sapphira were Christians who had opened the door to the devil, who took advantage of them to their demise. And this is where the teaching that I mentioned before, that um, demons reside in our soul but not in our spirit, uh, can come into play here that Ananias and Sapphira did allow Satan into their soul, 
uh, but their spirits were were saved. I'm again, I'm not sure what I think about that. I I know the the apostle Paul says that um, each person will be judged according to their deeds, whether good or evil, and that doesn't mean uh, like in the in the uh, Muslim sense or in the way many people kind of by default think of it, do my good deeds outweigh my bad, but rather your true heart will be revealed. I believe that we will stand before God on judgment day and the truth of our heart will be revealed and including whether or not our heart is repentant. Uh, Some of us struggle with sin. Some of us struggle with things that we don't want to admit it to sin. Maybe someone has pointed out, I know this was, okay, I know this was true in my life, so I'll just speak to this. People told me when I was younger um, that I had a problem with pride. And of course, that offended me because I had a problem with pride. But I was a worship leader. I was dedicated to Jesus. I was as dedicated to Jesus as I could possibly be. And God was using me. The Holy Spirit was upon me. I knew I know that for a fact. And I would be I would lead worship in many different places. People regularly commented on how they were affected by it and it was different. Like like I have um the Lord has equipped me to lead worship it, with a gift. It, it's a gift. It's a skill. It's um an anointing that not everybody has. I know that for a fact. Um and I was I was functioning in that and I was loving Jesus. And I had a spirit of pride. That spirit of pride didn't get dealt with for many years after uh, when that was first brought up to me, probably at least five. Um, And then, um, you know, and it was, thankfully, it was dealt with. And one of the things about that, the the pride was actually rooted in... um, in spirit of rejection, you know, that there are these uh, places where I felt I had been rejected or I had been rejected, and I just anticipated being rejected. And so what I would do, um, and this is how, how I got deliverance from it, was just one day I realized I really do think of myself as being better than other people. And I know that's such a gross thought. Like, nobody likes somebody who thinks that they're better than other people, and I really do think that I'm better, and yet at the same time, I know that's a bunch of crap. Like, I'm not better than other people. Why do I have, why do I believe such a gross thing? Why do I believe such a lie? And I realized that the reason that I was, I believed that was because I didn't think other people would value me. I expected other people to reject me. My experience had been, especially in the public world, not necessarily in my family, but in the public world that, uh, you know, that I, I had played baseball as a teenager in a city league where I was bullied constantly. And so it was just my expectation. That was just one. There are other instances too. But it was my expectation that in the public world, people would reject me and not value me. That's what it means to be rejected. So I tried to value myself over them. And in the only way I knew how to do that was by devaluing them, by looking down my nose at them. So I was rejecting them before they had a chance to reject me. And that was the source, the main source of my pride. And uh, so there's this patience with God in the middle of that, that he loved me, he used me, he was pleased with me, at the same time, I had this demon in my life of pride, the spirit of pride. And uh, so God is gracious. And, and if you today are wondering, do I have a demon? That's a great question to ask. Uh, you don't have to worry about the, the answer. If the answer is yes, it doesn't, it, it doesn't change God's love for you. God still loved me, anointed me, used me, was pleased with me in the midst of my sin. And then when I when it came to a head, I realized it was because I didn't believe in His love enough. When I realized that God did, that God doesn't love me because um, I always did the right thing, which is what I I the conclusion I had subconsciously drawn. I believed that God loved me because I always did what was right, and therefore I couldn't be criticized either. Again, the spirit of pride, because uh, if I d- did something wrong. What that meant, in my mind, was that God didn't love me, and that was a lie. When I realized that God just loves me because he loves me, because it's what he wants to do, uh, then I could lay all that down and just say, thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Thank you for your blood. Thank you, Lord, that I don't have to uh, keep running in this uh, this hamster wheel 
uh, trying to do another thing to make you pleased with me, trying to keep your love. Um, And Lord, forgive me because I have made other people run in this hamster wheel. I have made other people feel not good enough. Um, I have passed on this spirit of rejection to other people um, and uh, because of the lie that I believed. And so I had to I had to repent of that, be set free from it. And what it did, repentance in that case, what it did for me was to uh, set me free from restlessness, set me free from fear. It set me free from broken relationships. I went around and apologized to several people who I knew uh, my relationship was was um, unhealthy with because of the the sins of my past, the pride, the the way I treated them in the past, um, the way I looked down my nose at them. And so I had relationships restored to me. I began to learn to make friends. There are more, there's more peace in my marriage. Um, I am uh, more effective in ministry. I know how to be uh, to empathize with people more. I know how to have mercy on other people more because I realize that the mercy that I need and that I live under and uh, and that that's what set me free. It wasn't um, try really hard to be a really great Christian and then you will have peace. No, it's know that you are loved and then you will have peace and then you can become a great Christian because you're walking out of confidence in, who, uh, in the way Christ values you. This is this is deliverance, you know. It's not. Um, this isn't about me being better than you. And in, in the story of Ananias and Sapphira, what happened was sad. I think it was necessary. Uh, obviously, the Holy Spirit considered it necessary um, for the sake of holiness in the church. But I don't think that God was any more angry at Ananias and Sapphira uh, than he is at sin in general. You know, the Bible says that Jesus became sin. God did not uh, crucify, in a sense, hear me out on this, God did not crucify Jesus on the cross, he crucified sin, because on the cross Jesus became sin. The wrath of God was against sin. God has never been angry at you directly. He is angry at sin. The, The times that we get caught up in the wrath of God is the times that we are embracing sin and we refuse to let go of it. And when God wants to destroy sin, uh, we, and we don't let go of it, then we we get caught up in that judgment. But God doesn't want us caught up in that judgment. And I do believe that Ananias in this moment got caught up in that judgment, but I believe that God still has had mercy on them because when they stood in the presence of God, I expect that they repented, that they had remorse. Um, and I, you know, I've said this before about Judas. Uh, Judas betrayed Jesus and I don't think that he expected Jesus to get crucified. I think he expected Jesus to fight back. I think that's why he betrayed him. He was trying to instigate Jesus into actions that Jesus didn't intend. Uh, and when he saw that Jesus got arrested and then crucified, Judas, it says, showed great remorse. And he threw the money back to the temple priest saying, like, I don't want this filthy money. I, I, I'm grieved. I, be, I betrayed an innocent man. And he was wanting to turn back the clock. He was wanting it to be, uh, to do it over. Um, and they basically said, that's no, not our problem. You do with, deal with it. And how did deal, uh, Judas deal with it? He killed himself. Judas had a spirit of suicide in him. Uh, but I believe that if Judas had lived to see the day of the resurrection, Jesus would have offered him the same mercy that he offered to Peter because Judas's sin was not unforgivable. Uh, and your sin is not unforgivable. Ananias and Sapphira's sin is not unforgivable. If you have a demon in your life, don't think of yourself as being uh, too dirty for God. Think of yourself as having the light of Jesus shined on you. The thing that wants to get away from deliverance ministry in you is the demon that doesn't want to lose its home. It doesn't want to lose its home in you. The the Bible talks about us being a house, uh, that a demon, when, when it's cast out, it wanders around looking for a place to live, uh, and it finds your body. It finds, uh, because demons don't have a body, and it latches onto yours. And uh, when a demon feels threatened, that it's going to be evicted from your body, it's going to manifest itself in anxiety and anger and trying to get you away from that deliverance ministry because it doesn't want to be kicked out. Um, And uh, so, you know, if you are dealing with demonic stuff in your life, don't be ashamed. 
just come into the light. The, the ministry of deliverance is not a ministry of shame. It's not a ministry of condemna- condemnation. It's a ministry of grace. By God's grace, Jesus is going to get that thing out of you. Uh, I think a, another sober lesson in this from both Ananias and Sapphira's case and in Judas's case is that you need to get the demon out now. As soon as you discover that it's there, you need to get it out because, you know, um, they say the, the demon, you know, how do you identify a demon? You identify it by its function. A spirit of suicide, what is its function? Its function is to kill the person it lives in, to get them to commit suicide. A spirit of obsession, its its function, its desire, its uh, all it really does is obsess over things. And so if you have a spirit of obsession in your life, you obsess over things because that's what the demon wants to do in you. Um, and in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, I believe that uh, the demons, demon or demons in their life, God simply pulled away his hand of restraint in this moment, uh, and it it took their life. Um, you know, I don't know if it was a heart attack or whatever, but I believe it took their life uh, in a similar way as Judas had this, you know, when Satan entered it, him, a uh, messenger of Satan. Um, it must have it been a spirit of death of some sort. It may have been more than one, uh, but obviously a spirit of suicide was there, and it it carried out its objective, which was to get Judas to commit suicide. If Judas would have received deliverance, uh, he wouldn't have, he would have received um, mercy instead of ending his life like that. And so if there's a demon in your life, it has malicious intent for you um, and you need to get it out. Um, uh, Don, uh, Don Larson uh, I believe that was his name. I want to say Bob Larson, but that was a pitcher, I think, in the Major League Baseball. Uh, Don Larson wrote the book uh, Deliver Us from Evil. Uh, his book was one of the first ones I read, um, you know, maybe six months ago. Uh, he was in the 60s, and he wrote this book about his journey into deliverance, how God brought him into it. And he told the story of a woman who had these epileptic seizures that they didn't, um, and I'm kind of paraphrasing the story just to get the sense of it, but they, they didn't fully diagnose that this was a demon in the, in the woman's life. And um, kind of the epi- they were, they were uh, trying to figure it out. She was having these episodes. Eventually, the episodes stopped, but without the demon, they didn't make the demon. The demon had never been evicted. And then it just sat there waiting for its time. Uh, and one day this woman uh, st- was at the top of a staircase and had an epileptic seizure, fell down the stairs, and died. Uh, and that is the kind of thing um, that can happen when we don't deal with the demons that are in our life. And I don't say that, um, I don't want you to live in a spirit of fear over that uh, because God is in control. If you want to get free, you're going to get free. But I do say it as a way of, you know, the fear of God is like, let's take this seriously. You know, the, the, um, Isaiah Saldivar says, you know, that uh, we know God has a plan for our life. No Christian argues with that. But have you ever considered that Satan has a plan for your life too, a plan of destruction? That's what a demon is there for. It's assigned to destroy your life. The devil comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So he's got his eye fixed on you. He's got a target on you. He's got a plan for you for your destruction. Uh, And so you want to be aware of that so you can uh, reject this plan and and embrace God's plan. You know, my dad died at 49 of a heart attack. Um, God has used that, you know, what the devil intends for evil. Like in the story of Joseph, Joseph says to his brothers, what you intended for evil, God has used for good. What Satan intends for evil, God uses for good. And the cross of Jesus is the perfect example of that. It seemed that Satan had won, but God turned that around. So uh, God, uh, Satan has plans for us, but God even uses him. Someone described uh, Satan as God's um, sheepdog. Uh, like God is using him for his purposes in spite of himself, in spite of uh, s- Satan. Like Satan thinks he's in control, but really God is just herding him around uh, for his purposes. And um, we, uh, 
we can be free. We need to be free from these things. I, I kind of derailed myself there. Sometimes I have so many uh, uh, rabbit trails, I forget which one I started on. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to say, you know, um, we need to be free. We need to recognize that Satan has an agenda to destroy our lives, um, and we need to we need to recognize where that agenda is being fulfilled. You know, if, you're, if your life keeps going towards the ditch, it's because there's something in your life that's grabbing a hold of the steering wheel and yanking your life toward that ditch. That thing needs to go. It needs to get evicted out of the car so that you can be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and go in the, to the destiny that God has for you. That's why this ministry is so important. So can Christians have a demon? Ananias and Sapphira did. They were spirit-filled, but they got filled with Satan it ended up in tragedy. They lost their lives. Um, they didn't lose God's love for them. Uh, and I say this all the time these days. You know, God's love for you is not based on anything you have done. It's not even based on what you believe. God loves atheists. God loves non-believers. God loves perverts. God loves witches. God loves Satanists. But the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is that a Christian is someone who believes that God loves them, and accepts that love as something that they need. But if you don't accept it, it doesn't, it doesn't stop God from loving you. It stops you from benefiting from that love. Um, Ananias and Sapphira didn't lose God's love, and we can trust that their judgment after death is right and proper. And I believe it, uh, and it's merciful. We know it's merciful because God is merciful. And I don't think we have to be afraid of, uh, we don't have to be afraid of condemnation. Because those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. I believe that Ananias and Sapphira were in Christ. um, And that they they needed to evict Satan. Uh, You and I need to do the same uh, before tragedy strikes our lives. So um, I hope this uh, little study was helpful. I I think I'm going to move this way. You know, part of my journey of... Overcoming the fear of man is really putting myself out there uh, in a way that is more vulnerable. I've always been, um, part of this is just being not that advanced technologically, but uh, I, I've always been careful to put out things that are, uh, I tried to make them as bulletproof as possible, Possible, even though I love controversy, and I'm sure I've said many controversial things, uh, as my cousin who introduced me at a men's prayer breakfast the other day uh, testified. He said, you can check out Carl's podcast uh, where he says many controversial things. Uh, I have never shied away from controversy, but I still have always tried to be very careful to kind of cover up um, vulnerable spots. And I think I need to let go of that. Um, And I'm trying to do that. And I want to have a little bit more of an openness on this podcast to just do a Bible study that's a little more free-flowing. So uh, if you have questions, you know, different things, those are all helpful uh, for for topics going forward. So if you haven't already, please subscribe, rate and review the podcast on whatever podcast app you use. Leave a comment below, share with a friend. Thanks for being with me. Thanks for being gracious with me. I know there are many of you out there that have uh, kind of walked with me um, through the different um, kind of theological themes I've pursued over the years on this podcast, and I appreciate you sticking with me through the ups and downs and the thicks and thins. Some of you unsubscribe um, because of something I said. Some of you subscribe because of something I said uh, that you may unsubscribe next week. Uh, but I appreciate everyone who who engages with this uh, podcast, um, who shares their thoughts, um, especially your encouragements, and shares it with a friend. I also appreciate your criticisms and uh, take those seriously. So thanks for being with me, and I pray that God does a great work in you this week, that he will point out areas uh, where Satan has an open door in your life, that he will cause demons in your life to manifest so that you can know that they're there. And I picture that like God putting a baseball up on a tee, like uh, when you're learning to play baseball, for those of you who aren't baseball fans, there's a little pole with, that holds the baseball, and the coach will put the baseball on the tee, and you can take a bat. Instead of having to hit a moving ball, you just knock it off the tee. And I believe that when God, when a demon starts manifesting, it's God setting us setting the demon up on a tee, and then he says, all right, take a whack at it, because Jesus says, I give you authority. Receive the Holy Spirit so you can do the work. 
All right, God bless you guys. We'll see you next time.